Hello, greetings from Hong Kong. My name is Billy Hao. I'm an engineer at NASA Glen Research Center. I'm on vacation right now, so that's why I'm recording this video. So let's talk about drones today. All right, so when we talk about drones, usually we refer to UAV or unmanned aerial vehicles. So the military have a long history of using drones in their military operation. So for example, like the Reaper or Predator, uh, but in civilian life, uh, we usually talk about quadcopters when we talk about drones. Uh, we use them for recreational use, like taking videos and just fly around for fun. So back in 2013, before drones are like everywhere, I designed a drone and programmed it as part of my graduate's research project. Now don't worry, the one that you're going to fly is going to look a lot better than this. But since this drone don't have all those fancy plastics surrounding it, you can see exactly what's inside. So let's take a look under the hood to see what makes the drone fly. The diagram in front of you is the system architecture of my quadcopter. The purpose of this diagram is to show how everything works together. So let's start from the top. First, we have the flight computer. This is the brain of the quadcopter, and without it, our quadcopter is just a useless piece of metal. Next, we have the power system, which provides energy to power on the drone. And then, we have the propulsion system, which basically spins the propeller and moves our drone. And then next, we have the flight logging system. You can think of this as kind of like a black box. So I had this because I crashed my drone a couple of times and I really want to see what happened. So that's why I have this system, but uh, the one you use probably not going to have it. And then we have the data acquisition system. Basically, it's just a bunch of sensors that help our drone fly. And then we have the wireless communication system. Now this is very important because this is how you're actually going to command your drone. As you can see, everything is connected to the flight's computer, just like our body and the brain. In the human body, we have blood vessels that travel to all the different organs to keep us alive. On top of that, we have the nervous system which is how our brain sends messages across the body. The nervous system is very important because it takes what our body sends and sends that data or signal back to the brain. The brain then makes a decision and then sends a command back to our body. For example, if I smell pizza, my nose will send a signal to my brain. And then my brain will think, oh, I'm hungry, I really want to eat that pizza. Then it will send a command to my body to move around to look for that slice of pizza. Our drone is very similar to a human body. As you can see in front of you, there are lines everywhere. Each line represents a cable in our quadcopter. So there are two different types of lines. The first is a power line. This is equivalent to the blood vessel in our body. Basically, it brings energy to the system and keeps everything working. Then we have signal lines. Those are pretty much like the nerve in our nervous system that brings signal and messages everywhere. In the diagram, power lines are red and everything else are signal lines. So let's dive deeper into each individual system. If you trace the power line, everything comes back to the power system. This is the heart of our blood vessel. It pumps energy everywhere. So our heart is the lithium polymer batteries. In the hobby, we usually call lithium polymer batteries LiPo battery. One of the reasons why it is so popular is because of its energy density. Energy density basically expresses how much energy can be packed inside a certain weight. And this is a very important factor because it determines how much energy our battery can hold, which in turn tells us how far we can fly. Now you might think, hey, why can't we just pack a bigger battery if we want to go farther? Well, one of the trade-offs is that if you pack a bigger battery, it usually means a lot more weight. And if a drone is heavier, you'll need more power to lift it in the air. And that means you will need even a bigger battery to lift it up. So you see, it's a vicious cycle. Because of that, battery technologies are very important in aviation. Therefore, there are a lot of research going on into increasing the energy density of battery technology. So anyway, let's go back to our lithium polymer battery. So one of the downfall of LiPo battery is that it is very dangerous. So in the RC hobby, we use lithium polymer, but in the industry, we always use lithium ion batteries. 
they are like related to each other. And lithium ion battery is like everywhere. Like for example, your phone have it, Tesla car is running off of lithium ion, planes have it, and we built satellite with it too. I don't know if any of you recalled, but when the Boeing 787 Dreamliner first launched, there were many cases of the battery overheating and creating a lot of smoke in the cabin. And then there are reports of people's phone like exploding in their face. And see, this is all because of lithium ion battery. So therefore, it is very dangerous if misused. In general, you have to be careful when using lithium type battery, uh, whether lithium ion or lithium polymer. So basically, there are a couple of rules. First, like don't poke it with anything. Like don't stab it with anything because that would just make it explode. Uh, when you're charging it or discharging it, don't pull or put in too much current because that will also make it explode. If you see it deform, like run away, like because it means it might explode. Basically, what I'm trying to say is be careful with lithium polymer batteries. Just treat it like a baby. Just, just be very careful with it. All right. So I think you guys get the point. Uh, let's move on. So if you trace the power line, you will see that the lithium polymer batteries are connected to the propulsion system. So what exactly is the propulsion system? So similar to a boat, aircraft have a propulsion system as well, and they both use propeller. Now the only difference between a boat and an airplane is that in an airplane, the propulsion system is pushing air, and in a boat, the propulsion system is pushing water. Now, did any of you guys attended our boat building workshop? If you did, you would probably remember that we drew a lot of comparison between water and air. Basically, water and air are both examples of fluid. In the boat building workshop, we talk about buoyancy force. Basically, if your vessel's density is less than that of the surrounding fluid, then you will float. For example, in water with boats, and then in air with hot air balloon. Since water and air are so similar, the vehicle that go through them are also very similar. In the propulsion system, that's basically the machinery that pushes us forward. The principle of how it works is basically of Newton's third law of motion. When you apply a force in a certain direction, there will always be an equal reaction force in the opposite direction. An example of that is when you punch the wall. Don't your knuckle hurt when that happens? That's because you're exerting a force to the wall and the wall is exerting an equal reaction force back to your fist. So applying this same principle to an airplane or a boat, the propeller's function is to push a fluid to the aft direction, whether it is water or air. Since the propeller is pushing the fluid behind the craft, there will be an equal opposite force going forward. So that's exactly how airplane and boats is able to go forward. They go forward by pushing the fluid surrounding them backward. Now in a drone, it's a little bit different because propellers are often mounted vertically. When the motor spin, the propeller will push air downward. And when the propeller push air downward, it will produce a reaction force going upward. All right, so that's enough physics. Let's go see some hardware. So this in front of you is a propeller. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about it earlier. Uh, its function is mostly to move air. Basically, the bigger the diameter and the steeper the pitch, the more air it moves. The more air being moved means more reaction force, so mean more thrust. But of course, when you're in mid-air, you cannot change the propeller, so you change thrust by varying the motor speed. Which brings us to the next component, the motor. Um, so this is the thing that spin the propeller. Basically how this works is that you feed electricity into it, and the higher the voltage, the faster it spin. So, you know, faster it spin, faster the propeller spin, and more thrust. And last, but not least, we have the electronic speed controller. So, this is basically the controller uh, that takes commands from the microcontroller or the flight computer and then convert that command into voltage. Remember, we can vary the voltage to vary the speed of the motor and the amount of thrust we get out of it. So, yep, so that's basically what I do. All right, so next we get the flight logging system. And this is very simple. It's basically just a simple SD card, a memory card, that records everything that goes on inside the flight's computer. And some of the information that it gathered, uh, well, it includes the 
well, everything. <laughs> but, um, um, so everything is basically the, the radio commands that uh, I give the drone using my uh, radio controller, uh, the sensors reading, uh, and then the output to the motor. So all of that gets uh, recorded inside the flight logging system. In real life, this is called a uh, flight recorder. Um, it's the black box inside a normal jetliner that you fly in when you go travel. I think almost all airplanes are uh, required to have that, um, all commercial airplanes. But um, basically, again, they record everything that goes on, like um, what the plane is doing, uh, you know, the f performance, maybe uh, what the pilots are talking uh, in the cockpit. Um, so this is very helpful when there's an accident. Um, when there's a flight accident, the flight investigator uh, usually search for the black box. Then they bring that back to their office and go investigate what's going on. And usually this is the only way that people can tell uh, what happened and what uh, caused the accident. Okay, next we have the data acquisition system. Basically, this is just a bunch of sensors that we are trying to collect data from. So, from our body uh, analogy, this will be our eyes, like how we can see, uh, it will be our skin, how we can feel what's going on, whether the temperature is cold or hot. Um, so yeah, so for our sensor, uh, first we have the inertial measurement unit, more commonly known as the IMU. So this is basically the core sensor of our drone. Uh, it contains an accelerometer that measures acceleration. Uh, it also contains a gyroscope. Uh, basically, it measures the angular rate, like how fast we are rotating. Uh, and then it also contains a, um, what do you call that thing? Magnometer. Um, so you can measure magnetic field and sense your direction. Uh, there's also a GPS receiver. That's the global uh, positioning satellite system receiver. Uh, it determines where you are on Earth. Uh, then there's the ultrasonic sensor. Uh, this is basically a range sensor that you can point downward and sense how high you are from the ground. And in case that you are going so high that the ultrasonic sensor is not picking up, there's also a barometric pressure altimeter. And this measures your height based on the air pressure. And then all these data get sent back to the flight computer for the flight computer to make a decision. Okay, next we're going to talk about radio communication system. So most drones out there will be controlled by a RC controller. And those have a range of around 1 mile to around 3 miles, depending on the quality of the product. Therefore, most of the time, you need to be able to see the drone in order to command it. However, in more advanced drones, there might be a path planning feature where you can plan a flight path for it to follow. In that case, you don't need to uh, command it all the way. In the military, drones are mostly commanded by satellite. That's because drones' operations are usually taking place in an area where you don't want to send someone in there. So that's why they need to be able to command the drones anywhere in the world, and satellite is the best way to handle that. If you take a look at my quadcopter's flight architectures, you will see that I have two radio modules. The first one is the RC controller that we talked about, and the second one is an XB radio module. The XP module is a radio link that connects the ground station, uh, which is basically just a laptop with a radio module plugged into the USB port. Uh, so it connects that with the drone. And with this radio link, it provides a second method of talking to the drone. One of the main reasons why I implemented a redundancy in the communication system is because in one of my test flights, I actually lost connection uh, to my quadcopters. I'm not really sure what happened to my uh, RC controller. Uh, maybe it's too old or run out of battery, but I wasn't able to control the drone at all. Uh, and it just keep flying up uh, and then hit a tree and then crash straight down. Uh, luckily, there's no one uh, under the drone and no one was hurt. But uh, after that experience, uh, I learned that redundancy is very important in aircraft. So uh, that's why I implemented a second method of commanding drone. So uh, if all else fail, uh, I'll, I can just hit a button on my laptop and it will command the drone to land automatically. Another advantage of having this uh, XP module 
is that I can live stream telemetry from my drone back down to my laptop. Uh, that way I can see exactly uh, what the drones experience up in the air. Uh, for example, I can live stream the GPS position data, uh, I can stream its velocity, its uh, acceleration and tilt angle, and I can also see what the flight computer is telling the motor to do. Uh, this is more important for debugging when uh, tuning the drone. Um, so most hobby drones is not going to have that function. However, in drone racing, uh, I know that FPV or I think first person view is uh, very popular. Basically, they live stream a uh, video link from the uh, drone's wheel back to like the ground. Uh, so you have a headset that you can look through. And yeah, that's very popular in racing. So that's another use of radio communication technology. And then finally, we have the brain of the drone, which is the flight computer. So have any of you guys taken our robotics class? In the robotics class, we use an Arduino microcontroller to control a car. And basically the same thing happened here. I used an Arduino microcontroller to control my drone. Basically, the microcontroller takes in commands from the RC radio. Uh, in addition, it also takes in the signals from the sensors. And then, it will calculate an output to the motor, which help us fly the drone the way we want it. As you can see, there are a lot of uh, electronics being interfaced to the Arduino. In the beginning, I have everything hooked up via jumper wire and it's just super messy. So in the end, I designed an electronic interface PCB board and that helped simplify things a lot and make it a lot neater. So now that we have talked about all the hardware in the drone, let's take a look at what's inside the flight computer. And by that, I mean the programming logic behind it. Uh, that's where the magic really happens. Now in the drone, it's a little bit harder to tell where is the roll pitch and yaw axis, um, but it's basically the same. The front of the drone, uh, which in my quadcopter is the side without the bar, because um, as I said, I wanted to mount the camera on it and that bar on the front would block my view. Uh, so that side is the front, and the rotation along that axis is called roll. Uh, and then, you know, on its left is the pitch axis, and then. And then with the axis pointing up, uh, that's the yaw axis. So now let's talk about how the quadcopter can use its four motor to cause the roll pitch on yaw movement. And here's a Chris. Can you recall what each of the rotations are called? In multi-rotor aircraft, there are many different flight configurations that's possible. So in my thesis, I tried out three different configurations. On the left, we have the Y6 configuration. The Y6 configuration is basically a, a multi-rotor aircraft that has three arms. On each arm, there are two motors, uh, so air is always being pushed downward and force is being generated upward. And then in the middle, we have the Quad Plus configuration. So it is named the Quad Plus because it's shaped like a plus sign. And then finally, on the right, which is the one I went with, uh, it's the Quad X configuration. Uh, basically, it's shaped like an X sign, so that's why it's called the Quad X configuration. So I chose this because um, I can mount the camera in the frontward direction without having an arm blocking my view. So uh, I feel like it's more useful to design the quad top this way. However, this also makes the drone a lot harder to control. Um, not when you control with the RC controller, but like writing the control logic in the flight computer. But I'll talk about that more later. Now in the drone, it's a little bit harder to tell where is the roll pitch and yaw axis. Um, but it's basically the same. The front of the drone, uh, which in my quadcopter, is the side without the bar. Because um, as I said, I wanted to mount the camera on it and that bar on the front would block my view. Uh, so that side is the front. And the rotation along that axis is called row. Uh, and then, you know, on its left is the pitch axis, and then, and then with the axis pointing up, uh, that's the yaw axis. So now let's talk about how the quadcopter can use its four motor to cause the row pitch on yaw movement. Hey there. Okay, so I've decided I'm just going to make a video. Uh, it's a little bit easier than me trying to animate it. Uh, because I'm not really good at animation and it's just taking a long time. So, okay, I didn't bring my quadcopter with me, so we're just gonna use a model, okay? Chopsticks. 
I'm in Hong Kong, so there's chopsticks everywhere. <laughs> um, okay, so first we're gonna start with the Quad Plus configuration because that's a little bit easier to understand. Uh, so remember, Quad Plus look like this. Okay, so imagine this is the front. Okay, this is the front. This is the back. Uh, this is left, and this is right. Uh, it might be inverted when you're looking at it because the camera inverts stuff. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> front, back, left, and right. Okay, so front and back. This axis is called the longitudinal axis. Left and right. That's called the lateral axis. And then remember, up and down. That's called the normal axis or the vertical axis. So we want to roll. Uh, do the roll uh, rotation. We roll along the longitudinal axis, so basically we roll this way. Okay. See, that's why I say quad plus is easier to understand because you can just grab one arm and play with it. So this is the roll rotation. If you want to pitch, you take the lateral axis. Pitch. Okay. Yaw is a little bit more difficult because there you, there's no arm going up and down. But imagine that it's one. This will be your yaw rotation, okay? So let's review, okay? Row is along the longitudinal axis. Row pitch is on the lateral axis. Pitch and yaw is on the normal vertical axis. Yaw, okay? Row pitch and yaw, okay? So, okay, so that's a uh, quad plus. Now, what's roll pitch and yaw in quad X? Okay, so quad X, it looks more like this, right? Uh, remember how I have the three crossbar uh, on the sides and the front don't have one? So, this is the front, this is the back, this is left, this is right. Okay, so this is harder because I don't have a axis to grab onto, but if I want to roll, it's this, roll, pitch, is this, okay, and then yaw is this, alright, so let's review, roll, pitch, and yaw, okay, so now let's figure out how to use the motor to control roll, pitch, and yaw, okay, um, alright, Back to quad plus, okay, because it's easier. Um, plus, so okay, so I think we said that this is the this is the front, right? Okay, so imagine there are four motors here. You have a motor here, front, back, left, and right. The motors here, okay. So let's say that um, we want to roll, okay. Roll is this rotation right here. We want to roll. What do you do? So we have a motor here, we have a motor here, if we spin this motor faster, that means it will create more force, that means it will push this farther up, so that's how you create a roll movement uh, this way, okay? Now if you want to roll the other side, you spin this motor faster than this motor over here, so it will roll this way, okay? So let's recap, if you want to roll uh, to this direction, you want to spin this motor faster because it will create more force and more force will push it more this side, okay? And if you want it to go like this, you push on this side, that means you want to create more force here, so you spin this motor faster. So more faster, more force pushing it this way. So that's how you do roll, okay? Now pitch is this uh, rotation right here, pitch. So can you guys guess how do you do pitch? Now if you think using this two motor, that will be correct. Now if you want to pitch this way, you will put more force on this motor because it will push it this way. So spin this motor faster, it will create more force and it will push it this way, it will pitch this way. If you wanted to pitch the other side backward, you will put more force here and it will uh, push it this way. And that's how you pitch this way, okay? So let's recap, if you want to roll, more force here, it will roll this way, or more force here, it will roll this way. That's how you roll. If you want to pitch, 
more force here, we'll pitch it this way. More force here, we'll pitch this way. Okay, so that's the row and pitch rotation. Now, how about this? How about this? Yaw. How do we control yaw here? Uh, well, you see, you can't really just move like any one of those because that won't do anything. Like, even if you just move this one and this one, you it'll create a movement like this way, right? <laughs> and if you turn this two on, spin faster, it'll push it this way. Um, so yeah, that doesn't rotate it in the yaw direction. So how do we handle that problem? Um, well, so it, in reality, the motor don't all spin in the same direction. So usually the motor, they spin in pairs. So usually this motor and this motor spin in the same direction, while this motor and this motor spin in the opposite direction. And by, um, so let's just say that you want to rotate like yaw, if you want to yaw like this way, you take the motor that spin in the opposite direction and increase the speed and that will make you yaw this way. It's a um, some physics, okay? So <laughs> let's not throw all those technical terms around, but yes, basically you take the two pair of motors and spin them faster uh, and then it will yaw, okay? That's how you control yaw here. All right, so that's the quad plus. Uh, Let's go to quad X. Remember, that's the difficult one. Quad X. <laughs> Whew. Okay. So, let's start with row, okay? Here, row, remember what row look like? Row. Okay, row look like this. So, how do we push in order to, it, for it to make a movement like this? Okay. So, remember, so this, in this configuration, you have to push two motor at the same time in order for it to roll this way equally. You need to increase the speed of this one and this one at the same time, same speed, in order for them to create the same force so that it will push them this way. So that's how you do a yaw. Now if you, sorry, that's how you create a roll, okay? If you wanted to roll the other side, uh, you need to increase the speed of this motor and this motor at the same time and that will make it push it this way and that's that how you roll to the other direction now if you want to do pitch pitch is like this if you want to pitch let's say you want to pitch forward okay if you want to pitch forward you increase the speed of this two motor at the same time and that will push it forward if you want to push it backward increase the speed of this two motor and it will pitch it backward okay so and you saw me right if I pitch forward pitch backward that actually causes a movement in the quadcopter right <laughs> and yeah that's how you control position so we control position by controlling the angle of the quadcopter all right so let's recap if we want to row okay if we want to row let's say we want to row this side you will increase the speed of this move to motor row then it'll row this way okay and also it will move this way um, if you want to row the other direction then increase the speed of this two motor this two motor then it will uh, row this way you want to row a uh, pitch forward then you increase the two motor and from the back they will pitch forward if you want to pitch backward then increase the speed of this two motor then it will go like this and go like this okay and then y'all same thing you take the two pair, the pair of motor, increase the speed that it will yaw in one direction. While if you increase the speed of the other two that rotate in the other side direction, it will yaw to the other direction. And that's how you will control row, pitch, and yaw in quad captures. Okay. All right. Now that we know how to control row, pitch, and yaw in uh, multi rotors, now we just need to map the different motors into the RC controller when we are all set, right? Well, at least that's the theory. Uh, let's see how Tanley do. I asked him to just do a level flight, just go up, see if he can do it. Ah, it turned out that Tanley is not a very good pilot. So I asked my undergraduate lab assistant, uh, Chen, 
uh, to see if she can do a level flight. Uh, let's see if she do any better. So it turns out that doing a level flight using multi rotor is actually very difficult because any slight disturbance is going to knock it over and it's just almost impossible to fly by hand. So next, we're going to talk about how the flight computer can account for this and balance the uh, aircraft automatically. So a drone, or any aircraft for that matter, have three different axes, roll, pitch, yaw. We need to control all three of them to have good flight performance. However, to simplify the problem, we're just going to treat them as separate uh, axes and let's just focus on one axis for now. So that's why I built the single axis motor balancer that you see in front of you. Uh, you can call it the motor seesaw. The objective is very simple. Uh, all I want is for the motor, the two motors to balance each other out and maintain a level position for the beam. I mounted an inertial measurement unit or IMU like what I talked about earlier on a beam. Uh, so that the flight computer can read what the current angle of the beam is. So here's the free body diagram of the single axis motor balancer. So in this diagram we see we have motor 0 and motor 1. Both motors are spinning initially. Can you guess what will happen if I increase the speed of motor 0? Alright, if I turn motor 0 on a little bit faster, I will produce a little bit more force in motor 0 and that will create a movement to the counterclockwise direction hence the whole thing will rotate counterclockwise and as you can see in this diagram we're actually a little bit uh, to the clockwise position we're offset by at the level by an angle of theta so yes we want to rotate counterclockwise that's why we're going to apply a force to the motor zero all right so let's take a look at another example and I apologize for this very rough sketch, uh, I drew it in paint. Um, so yeah, in this balancer, in this situation, we are basically tilted to the counterclockwise position. Uh, how can we command the drone so that we are balanced again? Well, if you think uh, turning on motor 1 a little bit faster than motor 0, then you'll be correct. So basically, um, how control system work is that we set the target. So here our target is zero degree, it's level is zero degree. Um, and then we find the error. So for in the first example, we found that our error is in the clockwise position and we're offset by a uh, angle of theta. So that's why we turn on motor zero to correct that error. And here in the second example, we have an error in the counterclockwise position. So that's why we use the motor one to offset that. Now. Can we describe this using a formula? And it turns out, yes, we can describe this using a formula. And actually, that would be the basis for a PID controller, what is actually being used in almost all drones uh, out there nowadays. Now, since PID controller is going to involve a little bit more math, um, I'm just going to skip it here. But if you're interested, uh, maybe leave a comment below or um, do some research online. Um, it's very important. Because when you play with drones, usually you can tune the gains. And when you tune the gain, you're actually just solving this uh, balancer problem. Um, you're trying to get the motor to achieve a certain target angle. And that's all you're doing. And then tuning the gain is going to determine your system performance. So it determines how fast your uh, balancer is going to reach the level position. Um, and then maybe if you hit it with anything, if it's how fast it's going to bounce back. Um, so yeah, that's basically all it's doing. So to simplify this, basically it's just looking at the error and try to fix the error. Okay, basically that's all it's doing. Just if, if you if nothing else, just use this as the takeaway. Okay, it's just the computer do this many times, um, and then it will uh, balance the aircraft. Okay, so let's apply this uh, PID controller to our single axis uh, motor balancer. And as you can see, it kind of works, but it's kind of wobbly, right? Um, is there anything maybe we can do to improve this? So this is where the cascade PID controller comes in. So remember earlier, we we're just controlling the angle, um, but as it's up here, um, we can actually control something a little bit more specific. For example, we're going to control the rotation rate. 
So if we have one controller controlling the rotation rate and then another stacking on top of that to control the angle, that's called a cascade PID controller. And let's see what its performance is. Aha, well, a cascade PID controller performs a lot better than a normal PID controller. And as you can see, if I hit it with a stick, it bounces back right away. So that's some good news. Okay, so we talked about how you can use a PID controller to control the angular rate. And then we can stack a controller on top to control the actual angle. And remember how in our uh, earlier discussion about flight's dynamics, by controlling a clock couple's angle, you can also control its position. Uh, what if we stack another controller on top of the uh, angle controller? And yes, if we do that, we got a position controller. And that's how some uh, drones are able to follow a certain flight path if you use a uh, position controller. Uh, but first, let's put a simple uh, cascade PID controller for the angle and angular rate to our drone. Uh, hopefully, we can achieve level flights this time. Let's start with the Y6 configuration. And as you can see, after applying the controller to this uh, drone, it flies a lot better. And here, we got the quadcopters, um, the quad X. And here's my research partner. Uh, he's hitting it with a stick to make sure that it performs well. Uh, to external interference. Don't mess. You're really testing it. <laughs> All right, I think we're ready for test flights outside. Let's go. Alright, so now that we've learned how the drone works, let's go find up some fun. <laughs> 